Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Nero, nero. Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo un fatto reale non è un'idea innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire non solo si tratta di un fatto di un avvenimento ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli perciò è più vasto perfino di quelli l'energia giusta, scegli di non sprecarla. Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. 
più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Scegli di non sprecarla. religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo, più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà, lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.
Buonasera. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to those who are in the room in Rimini, in the Fiera, and those who are following us remotely in streaming or who will follow us on demand. First, before greeting our guest, who I have the honor and, and also a bit, of, a bit of reverential fear to present to you, um, I'd like to, to greet all our friends. It was the third day of this 44th edition of the meeting with the title, The Human Existence is an Inexhaustible Friendship. I'll greet also the many authorities who are present here in the, in the hall, and let's get a start on our encounter. First of all, thanking and uh, greeting for his presence, a, a, a guest who's not the first time he's come to the meeting, but the Under Secretary of the Presidency of the Council of Ministers, the Right Honourable Alfredo Mantovano. Thank you. Thank you for having accepted our invitation. Thank you for being for having come back again to find to meet us once again and I uh, hope you've had a chance to see uh, I think you believe you've been to see some of the pavilions of, of the Fiera and see what's been here and this moment of, of chat that we, of dialogue that we're going to have is because we've decided to indicate as a title this one what is changing in Italy it's not a generic title because we're going to refer to the fact that we're coming from years certainly very complex that we've all lived in the first years of COVID and then the, the, the last year with a crisis of energy, particularly that's significant. And we're living in a not simple moment in, with regard to family, etc. And as has been said before, a period of change of epoch. And this change of epoch that uh, what was discussed even uh, we, it just after the meeting last year, we had a change of, of government. So more or less 10 months ago, the new government came in, which, uh, so we'll start straight away with the questions, which what initially was looked at with a bit of suspicion, perhaps the government from the m international media, with the preoccupation that there might be some a political actor that was perhaps to be feared and in consequence, in the international media, they painted a picture of a, that was uh, quite worrying with, with, uh, in contrast to what actually was happening in the development of the country. So 10 months after, it seems that this image, this reputation, this positioning of Italy at the, the international level isn't quite the same as it was 10 months ago. And so, first of all, I'll ask you if effectively this change of consideration, uh, is it, uh, what has that, what's happened to make this change? So, firstly, thank you for the invitation, uh, for the director of the meeting, Emanuele, and I thank you all for being here. And also, I greet all the authorities who are present and, and all of you, the friends here, uh, who many of you have known for many years. So, what's happened and what's happening when you meet a person that, that somebody's, when somebody's spoken ill of you and you meet somebody? If this person who if, if they don't have prejudices, this person, that aren't insurmountable, the person who's listening to you, he'll, he'll grasp that the good sense and reasonableness will, will prevail. And, and the, thing, the stories that have been recounted about you, that they, they, they understand that those and you become an ever more trustworthy partner. So what are the outside these um, personal things that, that uh, go into a relationship between the uh, leaders of state and of government, which aren't a second level factor, but what are the factors that above all, I think, have contributed to this change of opinion at an international level with regard to the Maloney government? I think we could pick out the principal ones. First would be that this government is perceived as a stable government destined to, uh, to, to endure uh, along the, uh, the lines of the legislature. And so it has, these things are important because it's happened in the, to President Maloney at the beginning of her, uh, of her meters with other world leaders and to grasp the, in the interlocutor that maybe within ten, in 10 months when you meet them again, that it's the same person and obviously this perspective of seeing, the, seeing that person again is decisive for 
constructing a journey together. And second factor that is above all useful for Europe, which we've never put in, in discussion the Europeanism, um, insofar as, uh, despite many critics uh, uh, claimed about us, if we decline our belonging, look at our belonging to Europe in a way that isn't neither supine nor bureaucratic, but we are in the European institutions, we are aware of their limits and the conditionings that, the, that they determine about what, how they can work and, and the individual states that belong to the Union, but aware also of the opportunities that the Union offers without inferiority complexes, ready to to, to not, not yield with what uh, you might look at the objectives. Third point, we have never put in discussion the international alliances which we are respecting, not regarding, with, notwithstanding the sacrifices that this uh, asks of Italy. And it's altogether, I'm thinking about the war in Ukraine. Um, that's obviously important. The support that we give to you, Ukraine is not just in terms of sharing uh, of a military alliance, but it's a support that has been made concrete uh, without a, a huge e media echo um, in the starting out and s internal civilian help uh, and also that the, the civil society uh, helped uh, in Italy to ways to guarantee uh, our energy uh, sufficiency of, of that of the Ukraine Union people. We, in going on, getting started, we've got some ways to bring this to, to fulfillment. We're very busy in this direction. We can talk about the success of the Italian genius with our collaboration in the Triennale of Milan. Uh, with Maxine and his president and the Ministry of the Culture and the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. We're looking to reconstruct, thanks to the Italian architects and the excellence of Italian architects, the Cathedral of Odessa. There are already some contacts going on with the city of Odessa and all this is a sign of a continuing presence in that area which is so difficult. Sure. From that area came some heavy uh, impacts on the life of Italy and, and in, in the life of, of many of those who are supporting this coalition. S above all, in terms of energy provision and the, the prices of raw materials, which uh, compared to what they were before the conflict, is a huge increase. But this, this is making us grasp the factors of the crisis, the elements of opportunity. This is making us open ever more to the south of the Mediterranean. In these months, this has contributed to the growth of the international credibility of Italy. It's brought us to closen our links with, uh, with Algeria, with Libya. The so-called TARP, which has been held hostage at the time of its start today, is uh, thanks to SIPEM, is aimed at providing the European the nations of Central Europe, Austria and others, Germany, and uh, the Italy has set off, started off an initiative almost of uh, sort of apripiste um, for the uh, European other European nations towards Africa, maybe our off, off piste. We've done, and we I'll talk about this later perhaps. These are some of the elements according to which we can talk about, which it, Italy is, was sort of thought of the, of the margins of the European, maybe more uh, outside than inside the Union, but uh, now it's been, rev it seems more that that, uh, that thought had little behind it. I will go back soon to the uh, international themes, but first I'd like to ask you a different thing, looking at towards the in to within our own borders, which some of the observers 
coming back to the to the beginning of this uh, path we're talking about, some of these observers doubted that um, a new government like this, with a representation that seemed maybe without much experience of ma managing the public affairs, could be uh, able to to lead a nation, and so it could be in some way was it able to, to deal with such complex challenges? And beyond that even, beyond it, you know, before even seeing the actions that, that were done. So what is the method of, the working method that it, you needed to imprint on this situation? So among, among my uh, tasks, there, there's that of being Under Secretary of the Council of Ministers, and I can attest that the work we've done so far within that council has been very, um, unified, very unanimous, and, and it's been a question of uh, an intense preparation, which did managed to to uh, to uh, un loosen some knots that that uh, on the technical or, or political side um, that that were perhaps there. And so, the uh, the meetings of the of the council were never very long, not because we didn't discuss anything but because many questions had came to the, th to the meeting already well-defined, or it was already clear what was essential. But there's also a method of work that we've started off, re really to, to go back to your question, that um, I th think uh, in Rome, I have a, that I've, uh, comes perhaps from an, an experience in, in a previous, um, previous role in the government, which, which I was as Under Secretary for the Internal Affairs, um, and in the last period in which I had this role, I had as a minister Roberto Maroni, and with Maroni at the beginning of that legislature and that experience of government, we found ourselves needing to face some uh, some really tricky knots, some tricky problems, uh, it, particularly the presence of the uh, Camorra uh, and the, the, the clans. Uh, there, we realized, um, we tried out a method that, that um, like Christopher Columbus might, uh, might attest, until, uh, until, you, uh, until you try, it doesn't stand up. So this consisted in picking out, time, time to time, the interested subjects, and sometimes that was the carabinieri, the police, the judicial authorities, but that picking out the objectives, the apprehension of the goods that were, that were illicitly gained, etc., and in returning to the particular place after 15 or 20 days to verify if those objectives were reached, if there was something else to, uh, to review concretely. So not, not that everybody can do what they want, but assist making more systematic the way of governing. And this stuck with me this, this way, because at, at that point it brought us up to right, really dis dismantling these clans and capturing some of the many uh, leaders, the most dangerous people there. And I tried to reproduce this same method now in the current experience of government. So, for instance, in the necessary works for the Jubilee. The Jubilee will, could start tomorrow, to 24th of December. And, and it was almost like it seems tomorrow that it's going to start. And what needs to be done to make it possible that the presence of the, pelig the pilgrims um, can be as uh, easy as possible. And so with the mayor of Rome, who, as, as you know, was, uh, was previously uh, had been nominated uh, to the Jubilee uh, organization, it's all, all now hab habitual to meet up every couple of weeks to review the works that are going from the, s right from the start of them being planned, to see how they're going on, see, and then look at the execution phase. And in this way, in over a few months, the, the work's going to starting, which unfortunately in these months will, will cause a bit of disruption in the life of the capital, more than uh, uh, that, that might be already there from uh, traffic works, etc. And so uh, the start of the Jubilee will permit a, a more easy way for people to move around and uh, a more decorous uh, welcoming to the pilgrims. So thinking of first aid posts and uh, etc. All the, the system of, of welcoming that, that we'll need. So the same method we, we're also following for the organization of the Olympics. And we're following 
the theme of uh, employment and and, 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 and anti-drug measures. So the problems are complex, but often what's put, we're putting together the different skills of different people. You can't let the circular, you can't leave definitions just, just to a circulated document. We need to meet together, we need to look at each other. Above all, to bring out the difficulties, then it can happen to, re to resolve them and then make some more steps ahead. Thank you. I think that even on this method, many times leaving a meeting, <laughs> leading the meeting is a bit like this. Uh, you, we collaborate together and everyone can contribute to the common good. So it's interesting to see how this can proceed uh, th with this method. But I want to go back one step to the international scenario, because the uh, first step, the, the first thing the government put at the center was the, the face of, the, to uh, confront the Africa issue. And so uh, back in June in, in Rome, there was an international conference on development and immigration, uh, immigration. and so there were many representatives and heads of state uh, from the Mediterranean, from the Gulf and Central Africa. It was abs for s some aspects was uh, un uh, unprecedented. And so this ended up with the Matei plan. So it'd be interesting to understand in what this plan consists and how it will develop. In North Africa is our present and it's our future those of us as Italians and us as Europeans, not only for the question of migration, it's also our future because of a question of energy provision. And also, moreover, I, I, I don't need to list the many reasons of, it, of our proximity with Africa. It is also for the, the prevention of terrorism, of, jihadic, of jihadist terrorism, which is one of these subjects which every now and again uh, comes back around and then d disappears again. So jihadist terrorism exists, it's real. There are entire areas of the African world that right now are under, are submitted to this. A huge part, a country like Nigeria, consistently sees large parts of its own t t territory under the, the dominion of Boko Haram which can, uh, institutes conditions like uh, similar to slavery upon that population, and especially upon young women who are frequently raped, abducted, and uh, are victims of all kinds of violence. And this is just a, this is a common expression of jihadist policy. Italy has a, a long tradition and a modern political will to to put it to, to to stand in front of Africa in a credible manner, S because it's not it's not seen as a country which has a as as long a, of a colonial or post-colonial relationship with Africa. I'll clarify what I mean. Starting from the the conference on the 23rd of July, which happened in La Farnesina, and which saw the representation of five heads of state, eight heads of government, and for those for whom neither of those two are present had the presence of other uh, authoritative people, in this case of the whole south southern area of Europe, everywhere from Turkey going all the way down until arriving in Morocco, including the Gulf countries, including some African countries with the whom it's possible in these days to, uh, to establish uh, negotiations. Though added to these, the EU that was represented by the President of the European Commission, von der Leyen, and the President of the Commission, Michel, and a whole series of international organizations such as the UN and various banks and financial entities. So t talking about countries, they, are, it, they have three levels. There's from where, the countries from where is immigrants come, transit countries, and the destinations for migrants, which mostly speaking are the, the ones that will give the, pl uh, creating the, the plan for Africa. So in what does it consist? In two, two rails that have to run in a parallel fashion. Firstly, an effective and concrete development of Africa. 
And the secondly is the regulation of, of flows of migration. When I talk about a non or non-colonial, not post-colonial agreement, that means that the attitude of Italy, which is has been shared, which has shared its table, hasn't been one like uh, recently the media has been talking about that it's been taken lightly because you don't conclude bad you don't, uh, forced negotiations with a document signed by everyone with a common agreement. There were countries there which aren't fast friends, and yet after an intense work of diplomacy, they were able to reach the same conclusions. So I say that it's not a colonial, but saying not a colonial agreement means that the decisions for single African states aren't uh, taken up in Brussels or in Rome or in Turin, but they're shared with the states themselves. So it's not something that comes down from on high. It's something that's agreed with Mauritania, with, with Guinea and with all the other countries in Africa, with the Central African Republic, with whom we've been having these negotiations. I've been saying Italy has a tradition in this sense, and it's there's no need to unnecess there's no need to unnecessarily underline it. Um, but even it has the political will right now, and right now, it's able to act concretely. It can confirm that it's not been a, a forced negotiation. It's not been a diktat. We've now been creating a, a common fund to develop Africa, and the United Arab Emirates have sh have shown their willingness to step in this direction investing into this fund the first 100 million euros and when there's uh, there's money on the table that's when uh, we start entering into a concrete discussion and you stop being generic concreteness means making sure that the work we're doing that the the various cooperation projects for the development of Italy are, are made coherent, are, made to, are, are tied together with all their objectives. And as such, we avoid random interventions that are sporadic or that are fragmented. It's also a creation of more jobs there and more jobs here for migrants who intend to come uh, legally and work. These aren't just words. A few weeks ago, it was published and it will start to be, uh, and it will be operative very soon, the Flussi decree in Italy, which for the first time is a uh, triennial decree, which will allow the arrival uh, over, the, over the three years of 450,000 foreigners to arrive in Italy, who will come in a completely regular legal fashion and will create a pathway this could be the antidote. It must be uh, our antidote and our solution, which will it will say it will uh, make these merchants of death lose money, and it will make the whole process more regular. And as far as the flussi decree is concerned, there's the possibility of an extra quota of quota outside of entry for an as for whatever aspiring worker who lives in any African state, not only Africa but also. But not also Africa, but we're, we talk speci specifically about this. Whichever worker has uh, can can have their um, training paid for by an Italian network of businesses. So we've been di on about talking about this for many years, and I think Flussi now has it can now bring people to my business who I need. I don't know what businesses uh, what skills these workers have, but the most adequate response is train these people there or refer yourself to a reality that you, to an, an entity that you trust to train them. And that's the best way to, uh, to bring people in without a quota, whatever workers are trained and willing to work. And lastly, but not finally, we want to involve, and we were, we were talking about privately recently with Iman Will about this work the third sector, which already is uh, undergoing an important operation and which needs to be brought together and to be not to lose its own autonomy or its own uh, the, the specifics of its own work, but to increase efficiency of its own actions. 
described like this, it seems all like uh, sunshine and rainbows, but we're, we're walking about, uh, we're talking about walking on a minefield here. It's very difficult. Africa right now is probably the most vast and tragic land than, uh, than that which, of, which is similar to what was Pope Francis was talking about recently and what Zuppi reproposed here at the meeting as basically third world war in small pieces. Russia fights in Africa. Part of the war in Ukraine is fought in Africa, trying to ex uh, remove Western interests of those who are opposed, of the Western nations opposed to Russia and Ukraine. For example, through the use of the Wagner company. Wagner isn't a set of company, isn't a one company, it's a network. There's some smaller societies based within it, and normally contractors, these armed fighters, aren't, they're set to, they're set to train, they're trained by industries that are, in, uh, by ex those involved in the extractive industries of diamonds, of oil, and this helps increase uh, trafficking and illegal, illegal activities. So there's huge level. It's huge levels of difficulty here. Even those outside of uh, Russia, there in the internal issues within in individual African countries. The the civil war in Niger is much bigger than Russia and the and Wagner PMC, and it, it it's it could be true that they will that these two entities will later uh, profit them profit from the situation by inserting themselves later. But there are crises started recently that we've forgotten about. Who talks on the media now about Sudan? And yet, you know, it's, been, it's only been five months since the beginning of the civil war there. Among the uh, issues, there's a certain rigidity of certain international organizations, to not to name but a few, the, the IMF, which even now uh, uh, is withdrawing the, there are issues with uh, over a billion dollars worth of IMF funds due for Tunisia with, that have been withdrawn saying that, need to, that Tunisia first needs to guarantee human rights and now we're allowing ourselves to, to look on where if, if you're not in a condition to pay the, your public servants among whom there are also policemen, you're not incapable of uh, guaranteeing public, public safety and we can see what happens where in, in all the cities from which uh, large numbers of boats enter, uh, depart from, full of migrants, they're not able to maintain security there. And it's, it's difficult to, to unblock this impasse without, and that's without even uh, counting the extent of the Chinese influence in the region because these countries, if they can't find any help of the realities which find themselves closer to the West, such as the in the Western sphere, like the IMF, if they can't get help from there, they look they look for somewhere else, and that's a help that isn't really of the most um, recommendable uh, partnerships that a country can have, as far as the West is concerned. But even towards the interests of those same countries, there's obviously many other difficulties. But to, to list difficulties doesn't mean that we renounce the the path that we've set ourselves on. And so let me to conclude here that what I don't think, to, what I don't think is just a, a digression. Uh, having a, fleeing from issues isn't a part of our Christian culture. I'm talking about the cultural and uh, civil pillars of Christian, of Christian civilization. A God who becomes man means that salvation doesn't come through a, a, uh, doesn't happen by a th by slaloming through difficulties, but rather by uh, taking them on and being their part of their solution. When in Europe, the the construction of the European uh, project was made to fail without even without fully rec. Uh, Despite the, um, even though uh, John Paul II at the time was espousing the, the necessity of Christian civilization at that time, people have forgotten the, nece the, the need for Europe. Because if Europe has acquired an identity or is 
as kind of, or, or as just a Western appendage of Asia. After the fall of the Roman Empire, it's because in Europe for centuries, the the, the hearts and minds were always uh, in, were, were, were nourished by by oret labora. This is the the one unifying force from Lisbon to Bucharest. I should say from Lisbon to St. Petersburg. And if now, 80 years after the end of the Second World War, war has returned in such a tragic way to Europe, and al along with many other additional causes, it's, it also means they've now rejected this unifying element that used to be present. For us, that's the, the, the magnet that binds together our plan for Africa. Thank you. Also, because the question for, for those who, who are linked, there's a lot of applause going on. I thank you also because the the point that uh, you've just just brought up is also a delicate point, which is that one of the con the conflict with the mat with the mafia here at the meeting. But right since the start, there's always been the theme of even the more, the more delicate themes like that one of the of the mafia, starting for testimonies, starting from. Uh, extraordinary people, uh, but extraordinary people within a daily life, like last, last year, you, re you remember very well, we had the, the, uh, the exhibition on Beato Livatino, and this time we've got one on the, the extraordinary figure of Don Pino Pugliese and Aldo Moro. And on our side, let's say, within the meeting, there's always been a great attention really to underline this, this last aspect, which you quoted. There's, there's a theme which also deals with institutions with regard to the uh, anti-mafia efforts, which was that President Meloni uh, has, uh, has often underlined herself. What are the actions that, th that, you're, that they're doing and, and what, are the, uh, what are the useful ones given the, in the light of the p cultural position that you've just described? So there are some themes which in some moments in our history as it Italians, I've had a, 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 a big weight in the media. Um, so like the anti-mafia work and the, against jihadist terrorism, uh, these themes, and then mysteriously they disappear. Like we said before, they're, they're no, no longer trending. But now they don't disappear in the work of the police forces, in the injustice, and in the government and the parliament. And so even if they aren't in the media fashion, they are in concrete terms part of our daily tasks. So the struggle against the mafia continues with the uh, following of objectives, historic objectives like the capturing of the, uh, of the leaders um, and we need to, to give honor to, the, to those who have made it possible to capture the last important uh, leader of the, uh, of the mafia. With, with what spirit do we face this, this side of the government's actions? With an awareness that we are not at, at year zero, we must be proud as Italians of the fact that those, the work that's been done in the last 30 years, let's uh, thinking back to the, uh, uh, to the uh, massacres of 92, um, this was unequaled in the world on the, on the plan of the levels of effective action and the level of the results that have been received, have been achieved. So Cosa Nostra in Sicily is no longer that thing that was 30 years ago. It exists, it's dangerous, it must be struggled against, but must be opposed, but it has a, its power is much less devastating than it was. An analogous uh, discussion, we could think about the Camorra, and they happened in, in many places, but uh, the homicides, 
which is a, clearly a terrible thing, uh, is an expression of power, let's say, in the language of the mafia. It's often the power, the real power, you manifest it when the when there's it's calm on the surface. It's, it's, com it's completely calm on the surface because there has a, there's, you have a dominion over what's going on, um, and there isn't something. It doesn't necessarily require there's something as dramatic as a homicide. So, criminality, the most preoccupying one is the andrangheta, and there's, they still require some results there that, that we've already had on the other two fronts, and there are some. Uh, enclaves in the territory in which we're still trying to concentrate our attention because it seems they seem to be abandoned territories which uh, which nobody was caring about the media doesn't even the, the local media and which instead show the um, the the that there's a criminal effects that are hard to uh, to remove also Pugliese and all that which has to do with the uh, Foggia province and the different criminal uh, realities of the mafia sort of type, uh, particularly in the Foggia. But I'll come back to the point that I think is important. In these 30 years, many steps ahead have been taken. You were talking about uh, Livatino. If we compare the, the instruments, the tools that he had as his disposition in, from the ministry as a, and as a judge, and and now what 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 the the justice system has at its disposal the the richness it has now it, it, it's the 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 field is incredibly different back in Livatine's time we're not talking 200 years ago we're talking just a bit more than 30 years ago there wasn't a legislation on the collaborators so it wasn't possible to reach to get news from within those criminal organizations. The possibility to, to take the, uh, the goods of the mafia was, was much more difficult then to confiscate things. Or there wasn't a, a national uh, anti-mafia direction, and so there were 150 different procurities uh, around Italy, and to collaborating with them amongst them was difficult. And that there wasn't this twin rail that we talked of, the restriction of the uh, benefits for those who commit these crimes, uh, mafia crimes, from which c follow also a, a higher level of, of social security. I think today the frontier is in not uh, ignoring the results we've, we've done, but to look at the steps ahead. Striking in a more, even more incisive way, the things that are illicitly perceived. The 29th of September in Palermo, we expect an an important conference, an international conference, with the representatives for, from many, many countries from around the world. In the 20th anniversary of the application of the the Convention Against Transnational criminal, criminal Crime, which was signed in, in Palermo, because Italian will pick up again the fact of being the center of intention in anti-mafia activities. And we'll try and follow everything with attention. I think that it won't constitute just a, a it's not by chance that the first, first move um, of that was that a, of a decree which has avoided the effect that were, were expected by, by, um, by a decision at the time that the Constitutional Court had taken. In the, and the last thing in time is that which, was preceded, that which preceded the last Council of the Ministers in August. It was those who tried to improve and to heal um, uh, saying that that was going on in the level of jurisprudence and wanted to restrict the possibility of using an instrument of of uh, uh, of investigation of criminal acts so the work is going on along the path of that which has already been done 30 years ago 
but never sleeping on our laurels, never, because we, we need to keep rowing against the current. If, you, if, you, if we stop for a moment, you'll be dragged away by the current. So the uh, forces of, pol of police, the, the uh, force of justice, you know, they, they've been working very hard. Thank you. Arriviamo. So now we arrive, uh, as maybe you could all uh, try to um, describe the, the, the many, many different fields that your, your office has to deal with. And so there's also a, a pretty long idea, a list of, of, uh, of tasks that, that, that uh, your role requires. Among these, there are some which we, maybe you speak of less, but also are really part of your work. So I'm thinking in particular of the intelligence, cybersecurity, which is a theme that's extremely relevant, pertinent, and maybe not looked at in enough depth. So I'd ask you to, to I'll bring this question together with another, uh, a, a different uh, as couple of aspects of, the, of your work. First is that of drug dependency because looking at the parliamentary report of the anti-drug department from a few weeks ago, there are some really alarming data. In 2022, once again, there was an increase in the percentage of 15 to 19 year olds who in consume drugs, at least one substance in the last year. And th that, number has, that number has increased. This increase is also in the, the young people who, cl who claim to have consumed illicit substances with a more frequent use from 10.9 to 18 percent. There's also the economic aspect of all of this. 15 billion euros have been spent on, on this effort. So I cited three efforts that that a part of your most delicate work that your office has to look at. Um, so, in the light of what we've already discussed, what do you have? Uh, what, what do you have in, in the works for this? So, let's start from the easy things: services and cybersecurity. Services. The, the most recent law, which has uh, regulated the sector, goes back to uh, 2007, and it's. The world has changed a lot since then, and two key elements of very novel here are the increase of activity that's coming from from the financial intelligence and cyber security. These are two aspects which are kind of strictly correlated because we could think of the the norms around the services of credit uh, to the virtual virtual consequences, software crimes, etc. And it's those have brought a, an increase in the action of the financial intelligence agencies. Two years ago, under the gravy, draggy government, there was instituted a new National Institute for Cybersecurity. Uh, I'll go I'll, I'll be very brief on this, but everything could be improved. This type of activity con is contemporaneously a, a defensive front, and which is expressed in the Golden Powers uh, exercise to protect certain aspects of the, particularly Pirelli, and an offensive side, which is that with the, which we use the various instruments of tools of the intelligence agencies. But there is a need that comes out from this, and it is the need to be more efficient, to avoid o superpositions, to uh, overlaps, to be more functional with respect to the needs of, the secu of national security, which are ever more sophisticated, ever more varied, um, both they need a, a very focused professionality. So if I s were to speak of unification of the secret services, then, then the uh, conditioned reflexes from the media would be that 
that the government to the right has come, and so they, they're typically authoritarian, and so the first thing they're going to do is put more power on secret services. And this, this one of the light, I think this is a bit of a caricature, let's be honest, because I think one thing is certain that I rec I, I've experienced this personally when I was the Minister for the Internal Affairs before 27. There, truly, there was a par clear partition between the internal service, which was called CISD, was depended from the Viminale, and the external one depended from the Ministry of Defence. And so at the uh, Council of Ministers, there was a little um, unit that tried to uh, uh, let each one understand what was going on without a great deal of success. The true novelty of the reform for 2007 was the unification of the political leadership of this. So both the internal service and the external service depend on the, the one entity in the government. So it's not unification yes or no, because yeah, it's already unified in that sense. So it's not cellulized, sorry. The problem is how to make it so that the activities avoid to look at criteria whether external or internal, which maybe could have been fair at the back in the times of the Kingdom of Sardinia, but are no longer relevant. So one thing we started in St. Petersburg, I'll cite the city again, this beautiful city, that has had the opportunity of blocking things in Rimini. What comes a concrete decision was made, and it had some da harmful results on, uh, on the internal. So which agency deals with it? It came from the outside and has effects on the inside. So the, the criterion that can make this more reasonable without risks of authoritarian issues. And to the best antidote to the power of information services security is a is a, con is a control by the Parliament, overview by Parliament, this, this overview that we already have, and it will be more incisive when the, the dis protected and reserved discussion between Parliament and government, the path so that there can be no um, anti-democratic ideas going on at all. So that's the easy bit. <coughs> the, uh, the, the drug dependency part. This is the difficult one. So here, again, we're talking about method. I found a world that's full of many, much generosity, much dedication, but very fragmented. And so with the department and the anti-drug department, we tried to put together the, the communities, health services, the regions, with a common work that, even in this case, has, has got periodic meetings um, and deadlines. So we've met each minister who's got something to say in that area, uh, imposing on them the problems and that they must find the solutions. And so there have been technical discussions. We aim, for example, to refresh the National Fund Against Drugs, which uh, from previous governments was, was uh, eliminated uh, and, and turned into something more generic. Now we're, we're trying to, uh, with the Ministry of Health, to, because even those who is, is a dep drug dependence has the right to choice, like anybody who has an illness in Italy, you're not constrained in, uh, within your own region. but. If I can also l allow myself, um, if you want to consider it a digression, the true challenge is the educative one. Those data that you, which are terrible, that you cited, they are terrible data and uh, that we don't uh, reflect on enough, which in a year, half of the adolescents do at least once that use of, of drugs is something that, that shouldn't let us sleep at night. 
And so, in front of this, the leap of quality is that of education, which means serious prevention, means inc much increase of messages uh, in uh, adverts and whatever, and even Roberto Mancini gave, gave very generously of his time to, uh, to help with this. And that's obviously just the start. We're, uh, we're betting on a, a, a more widespread presence, more diffused within schools, also thanks to the testimonies which can come from within the, these communities. But we cannot, we can't just go to the focus on the reduction of harm, because that means accepting defeat. What does the educative challenge mean? I'll give a concrete example. So much of my life, uh, I, I wasn't in uh, government. I was, I, was a, I was a judge, so I go from fact, concrete facts. We all know the uh, tragic story of Pamela Masco Pietro, even though more than five years have gone since her death. She was a Roman girl, 18 years old. In 2018, she was killed in Mascherata after having suffered a long sexual violence from a Nigerian citizen who uh, then uh, took her to pieces. And, uh, and I've met more than once her, the mother of this uh, adolescent. And so in this really terrible, upsetting thing, there is a step which, which strikes me still more than any other, more than the treatment, dishuman treatment that was done to that by, to, by her assassin, who now is in a community that, that I understand. I've, I've, I've visited it recently, and I appreciate it. From this community, you went, she went away uh, without unknown, a little before being killed, and on the road, she was met by a passerby in his car. She didn't have a, a, a penny to her name. She needed some money to, to buy drugs. And he, an Italian, adult with a job, finding this 18-year-old girl, by the way, he treats her like, like a commercial goods. He gives her a bit of money, maybe what she needed to buy, the last dose of drugs. And he buys a sexual relationship with her. I don't know if it, it would have come to end the same way if that guy, looking at the evidence, had accompanied her back, back to the community, or if he'd had towards her a little bit of piety, a little bit of pity. Because, and these are what we call you know, people in good, good standing, not drug dealers. And he could have used different way his own freedom. Even on drugs, our approach can't be just ideological or quello che ci interessa realmente non sono i milligrammi in più in me. We're not interested in minor questions of milligrams of dosage of what's happening here. Ultimately we're drawing the line on something more important on the importance of, of terms such as freedom and of responsibility, prevention, education, and neighborliness. These are the tracks on which we want to move ourselves and on which we are moving. We're currently making progress in that direction. I'd like to thank you because especially to so transparently and so deeply uh, face these issues, it, it helps us to further understand them and to, to judge all these multiple different aspects like freedom, education, responsibility, themes that we, we're talking about in these days as well and that we, we, we often experience. Unfortunately, we're we, we've not got limitless time here, and so I'd like to make you one final question. Easy question here, in the sense that, in the light of everything you've already told us, what is or what are therefore today 
the the most difficult and the the most major challenges, the most interesting ones, maybe maybe or the most difficult ones that are on our horizon. So, I don't want to I don't want to steal Minister Rochella, who will speak soon. I don't want to take her job to talk on the on on exactly on this topic. I'll just simply raise it quickly, but. I'll follow on from what, yeah, from what the Minister Giorgetti said yesterday. The most, Im and I'm only talking about this because it's a challenge that doesn't just refer to the to his ministry or, or the manager of financial management, but it it refers to the entire government. the The most important challenge is is that of the birth rate, and more imp it's more important than, than energy supply. It's more important than uh, institutional reform. It's more important than the regulation of migration. Because a social body that renounces uh, bringing new children to this world is a social body that demonstrates to have no hope in future. And it's a major, ch it's a challenge to take very seriously, identifying a uh, a stage by stage process that brings together on one hand cultural, pre-political and political thing, uh, topics, and also puts aside easy slogans. Because, you know, if the demographic winter and the ex and uh, the continuance of more than 50 years of pol policy against the family, we can't imagine that in nine uh, months we'll, we'll, we'll turn the whole situation around. I, if everything's going well in nine months' time, we'll, we'll, we'll take a few more steps forward. There have been some concrete signs from our recent laws that have been going through, and Eugenia will talk about this for sure. There are some concrete signs uh, in our fiscal system, and the Vice, Vice, Vice Minister Maritza Leo has spoken about this, and uh, has spoken about this recently as well at a recent conference. But as far as our discussion about uh, drugs and the like, let's not imagine that everything can be resolved with incentives. We want we don't want it to be a subsidiary approach. We're not we're not the the, the, the Chinese Communist Party that decides one day only only you're allowed one child and everyone else it, and then you know later decides, oh you know what, let's change this, uh, we we retract that. For us being a, a subsidiary isn't something that a uh, that should be taken lightly. We we take part in the in the group on subsidiarity that looks at this aspect, and so the uh, subsidiarity approach doesn't mean that uh, inserting the state in the family, but putting families in in a situation to conduct their own uh, a business, their own affairs as as well as possible. The demographic winter and the the, the no the, the government's knowingness of this is the greatest crisis that Italy faces nowadays. I use the word crisis. I'm giving to the term the the definition which Pope Francis has given to it. And as you all know, he distinguishes crisis from conflict. Conflict is a negative word. Crisis is something that can have positive developments if it becomes an opportunity to uh, to build. That's it. it was the, that was the case for Italy immediately after the war, where after the reconstruction, after the re, the growth of a devastated, destroyed nation, it correlated with demographic growth. The demographic boom, what came in the the final moment, the final stages of the it of Italian economic growth in this in 1964. I find it very easy, uh, very useful to read every year the uh, the census report because it allows us often in a few words to um, to get the sense of what matters and what's most important in the Italian social body and the most their most recent report in order to qualify the uh, the, sta the state and the Italian social body uses the category of uh, of, of melancholy. This is, it seems like a very poetic, romantic term. What does, what does 
what social impacts does the word melancholy have? What could that mean? And yet, it, it, it's correct because melancholy is that is that kind of bending back on oneself that makes you not look to the future. That that makes you just sort of go day, live day by day, but in the worst sense of the term, carpe diem, and as such, to 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 not want to have children. And so, having considered this, I, I don't have any aspirations to a to any kind of ch uh, dramatic changes to the state here, but the, the coalition that I have the honor of being a part of encourages, as far as its, its competency is able, a new policy that will that, that should r reveal, once again, the beauty of bringing children into the life that should to rediscover in a, a non-scandalous way to bring back the right of every child to have a father and a mother that fights for as a that fights for the consideration of maternity as something that that shouldn't be sold or rented we believe that this isn't something scandalous we we fight for this we fight for the fact that that you don't choose children out in a catalog picking their color you know, or the color of their eyes, or their features, or how predict how much you can predict them to be tall. We we are aware that you could talk about for for real taking back what's happening when the the demographic curve it starts to turn upwards again, when it starts to recover, when children start coming uh, being born into this world again, when every uh, pregnant mother is considered the pinnacle of society. There is the true beginning of a lively, strong society, healthy society. And I'll, I'll use the uh, an expression of a great, uh, a great pope, Pius the Twelfth, who said, "We shouldn't uh, resign ourselves to the definite to the definiteness of history. There's nothing definite." And in fact, the last thing I'll uh, I'll add on, thanking you all very much for paying for paying attention and for the for your hospitality, is that now in 2023 is uh, the centenary, which I hope uh, won't pass unobserved, and I don't know if you'll speak about it here at the meeting. It's the centenary of the writing by Thomas Stanelliot of that amazing poem, which is the the desolate land, in the in the desolate waste, it wasteland, he writes that uh, he hopes you could make the most of its fruit. The wasteland does not bear fruit and it's arid. It has many far fewer children, far more old people. It's the most concrete sign of ar and of objective aridity in our in in our society. And all this happens exactly because. Are, are, the roots have been torn out. For us, these roots aren't so, uh, something confessional. It's not something we, they, they're, they're a piece of historic uh, data that's completely lay. And that's something. And this is part of the work that the meeting has been doing for decades. And it's a part of us. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo, and I think that the applause we're hearing now uh, really show that the, our conversation with you is something where we, we've learnt we've learnt something quite important, and we've learnt something about you as Under Secretary. And so we thank you for coming here. You've mentioned many topics, even with a the, the, with the, the kind of provocation you've tried to give us. Will be the uh, will catalyze some uh, some further discussions that we'll dive into over the next few days, and we'll hope to relay back to you what happens. I'd like to close, obviously, thanking everyone who's been who followed here in the in the meeting and those online, and that there's remind there's a possibility to continue supporting the meeting physically or digitally. That red heart that you see on the screen now. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day.
civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. giusta, sceglie di non sprecarla.